Hello and welcome into the Soria Data Football Strategy Show. I am Leidinho. Sorry, everyone. I'm Andrew Laird, Lairdinho on Soria. Joined today by some superstar matchup here that we're going to have a nice conversation about. PSU fans, too. There we go. Nepenthes back again. Guys, the only reason, not the only reason, biggest reason I want to have this conversation with the three of us. And Nep, you don't know this, but you, even though you were there. So you and Sean and I are in a Discord together, and you guys were having a conversation about our show from last week and discussing all of this. And Sean sends me a message, and he's like, I don't know how many like, really good conversations I've ever had in Discord, but I can remember two of them, and they were both with Nep. And I was like, well, I appreciate we should that. just actually talk to each other. They were, I, I actually... I, they yeah, they actually, about the same thing as well, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, I, they, similar, similar. I won't yeah. say the same thing, but I, I actually said it's slightly different than how Laird said. But I said I've had like two actually in-depth, intelligent conversations with someone, period, and they both just so happen to be with you. Well, <laughs> it's, it's not on purpose from my side. You know what they say: even a broken clock is right twice a day. So I got lucky on those ones. Those were the two, unfortunately. Yeah. So everything else <laughs> yeah. from now on, yeah, yeah, that's know, it. I've, just I've not even uh, thanks everyone for joining. Like the video, even though Nep says it doesn't matter, it matters to me. So just uh, just do it, please. Anyway, um, I don't want to rehash the entire conversation, but I feel like we need to a little bit. But a lot of it was essentially about last week's show of do you is it better to have super rare, you know, good super rares versus the really good rares? And it felt like the conversation that you two had got a little too hung up on the specific examples they were using. And so, Sean, the one that we came up with last week was the Julian Dessart Super Rare. By the way, if anyone didn't watch last week's show or listen to it, just go back and do that at some point. And Nep, you brought up Alexander Alvarado, Rare, and we were kind of comparing the, the two scores. One of the points that you brought up, Nep, that I thought was valid, at least, because I didn't do this last week. We were talk We basically took out like we looked at Julian Dessart's L40 on his last starts, and I didn't really do it with the other people that we were comparing him to, like Kimmich and Zellerion. Part of that is because it felt like those guys always play anyway, so taking out like bench or uh, DNPs wouldn't change it that much. But it was a, it felt a little apples to oranges, and Sean was like, "No, it's fine, just do that." And so I wanted, I feel like we need to at least get away from those two players because I think. We just got caught up in them. But the conversation did include the first time where Sean was like, okay, I can see it that way. Because Sean doesn't. Ever... <laughs> I'm not saying you were agreeing with him. He must have I was missed, just saying you were like, I okay, I can see where you're coming from. And yeah, I, I think that was first of all, it's like, I, I, I somewhat agree and somewhat disagree that good super rares are needed. And I have got a few points as to why. It's like I watched obviously the Surrey data, all of your shows every week on every single one. I don't miss one. And this was the first time I'd ever thought, like, there's a few times where I've like nearly messaged about things I didn't agree with or maybe had a different viewpoint on. This was the first time where I was like, no, this just isn't fair. Like, this, and, and I didn't actually have anything to talk about. I didn't have any other players. I didn't have anything to be like, what about this or what about that? I was just like, well, hold on. As, but and then you know the the conversation did did develop and uh, yeah I do think like you know kind of like micromanaging one particular player and trying to pick their scores out it's it's pointless uh, on either side of the debate but it would be interesting as an overall um, and as I said at the end of the conversation I wonder if like even SD have got some things out of that conversation where it's like okay these could be really cool features that people could sign up use my code for um, <laughs> uh, to to get at that star star membership, you know, the, I will say most of your, most of your streams. And if anybody doesn't know Nep streams about Sora, pretty, what feels like every day. And I was just giving him a hard time because one of them, the other day I was trying to watch and it was nine hours long and I just didn't have nine hours in me. Um, so, uh, yeah, over on Twitch at Nepenthes, follow him on Twitter as well. Excellent Twitter follow. But the the number of like, this would be a great Sora data feature. And I'm like, ah, let me write this one down too. <laughs> um, but there was a lot of discussion in that in terms of like peak scores or not even peak scores, just like how often somebody scores 70 versus the Super Rare score 60 because they're kind of similar. 
And so, Sean, what what of that conversation were you willing to give away that Nep was like right on something? Because it did. No, I mean, I I think he makes valid valid points to it too. It like you said, it's kind of a bit of a an issue where we share we were just talking about two players effectively right like we talked about two players in a vacuum and nep had an issue with the with desart because of us removing effectively his his non-starts whereas other players we weren't removing their non-starts so they were punished by it but what i said and this is what i thought he was wrong with in terms of like that precise specific example was desart's issues and his DNPs were very clearly, um, it was very obvious what the reason was behind them. And there was a very clear point with them. And that point has been removed from what the current player is that is Desart, right? It would be the same thing. Uh, another example, I guess, I would give in terms of who I would do this with would be like if you included Florian Wirtz and you included his non-starts like when he was just coming back from his injury and you knew that he was sort of going to be a sub risk non-start risk in terms of minutes he, they wouldn't be great for him it would be similar so the difference is is to start when he first came back from his long-term injury he was like a sub for a while then got injured again then ended up being a sub for a bit again until he was back to full fitness then he was starting it but so like if you look at the l40 of the start the last 29 games for him, he started. So using a sample size that includes like, let's say a 30% part of the sample where he just wasn't a starter is probably a pretty inaccurate view. Now, if he was someone that just rotates in and out of the lineup and was like a guy that doesn't play all the time, then obviously you don't want to exclude type of that part of the sample. But so for me, I think that removing a part of the sample that doesn't seem valid on someone is fine. Whereas Nep thinks that you had to include that part of the sample because it is still part of the sample and it is part of the L40. No, I didn't think you needed to include that. I think you needed to exclude that for everybody else as well. Fair. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and when, when, like looking at his scores now as well, one of like I, you know, the conversation we had, I kind of learned this whilst I was kind of typing it through and talking it through like in my own head is when I, I, you know, one of the last times we actually talked about super airs, one of the benefits of a super over rare obviously is that when they hit those peak scores, they get a gigantic advantage. And with someone like Desart, uh, you know, I don't know what his price was for the, where it was like 600, 700 pounds or something like that. I don't think that there's enough dark green scores in there. If, if you're a player that can only afford a good super rare in the first place, I, I honestly believe a very good rare is just better for you because you're going to get a consistently higher output over a consistently longer time than those, in my opinion, four or five games in that entire 29 game period where he might have been okay for you or, or, or would have would have been a difference maker. But in a lineup that if you're putting him in any way, you probably aren't winning with. So I think the... I understand where you were going with that. And I just wanted to, there was a quick question from KB97 that says that you don't need super rares is referring to rare pro. So yes, we're talking about the rare pro division. Yeah. And whether, cause you don't have to play super rares, but you can play up to two. And so that's where we're going with that. But the, I think looking at a score graph like this, that there are not that many peak scores. You have to remember that. I mean, I don't think anybody has like a specific, definition of like what a peak score is but like we think like 90s or 80 i don't know what where you want to put it off but the 20 percent makes the peak score like we we look at this chart and we're like they're just not that many peak scores but what is that three four, five, six, there seven. Yeah, yeah seven like games over 70 and that's 70 without the 20 percent bonus and so like would you consider anything over 70 being a peak score for a super yeah, that, that that's that's where i kind of like drew the line was like i think anything over 70 it may, may, maybe 80 depending on how good the rare is like if you've got messy you're going to need a super rare that's hitting over 80 um but i i think o over 70 is very reasonable compared to a sort of like 85 to 90 for a rare and that's why i, I took um alvarado because if you look, and I understand, appreciate it's just a 29 game spread. 
but he only has seven scores over 70, whereas Alvarado has considerably more scores over 80 um, and, and on a percentage basis is just better. And then you now have to factor in, which we only really kind of touched on the back end of the conversation, collection bonus. And so as I was like talking this, like just talking just now, I thought, wouldn't it be cool for Surya Data to have a feature to be able to tick a box that gives XP bonus to these graphs so you can kind of have a look at what score they would get as a super rare with collection bonus or without, with XP or without. That would be real cool because that would give you a more functional visual on what's actually performing better rather than sitting there and having to like, you know, dice it up or do the math yourself. Yep. Yeah, I actually thought that was a pretty valid, that that part of the conversation was at the end where Net brought up the collection value. But I, I think that definitely matters a bit because in theory, and this was what Nep said, was that rares are easier to get a collection bonus for typically yep. than super rares, which is true. Uh, you're typically going to have more rares than you will super rares. So like on average or in general, I would say you probably get like one to 2% additional from a rare comparatively to what you would get to a super rare um, in terms of a card. So I do think that plays into it. Obviously it's a bit of a, it's a small uh, difference because it's like a 5% to 10% difference in the score on a given week. So it's not like huge, but it does, it does add up. So like, I know, I don't know if you guys saw, but somehow Haber is on the podium <laughs> all-star rare pro which just not sure how that happened but two percent on a card would be the difference between him finishing third and him finishing first so like that two percent can totally come into play uh with a situation but yeah so for me this is sort of how i look at cards i guess and how i look at scoring if you put up 80 to 100 that's a good score and that's where you're starting to pick up the slack for some other people if you score between like 70 and 80 i'm like all right that's a good score you're carrying your weight if you score between like 55 to 70 that's when it's you're okay you're keeping the lineup alive but you need to be picked up a little bit from other cards so that's sort of like how i look at scoring is like i want obviously guys in the 80 to 100 range but i know it's not fully possible for everyone but i know if they're putting up like a 60 they might need to be picked up a little bit but a 60 still keeps your lineup alive net said uh that he felt that if you're getting 60s, you're eliminating yourself from a chance at a podium. I don't think you're necessarily uh, removing yourself from a chance at a podium with a 60. Obviously, you're making it less likely and you're making it necessary for the other cards to pick you up more, though. What is the thought uh, that Johanneton brought up that a very good rare has more utility? Which, before you guys answer, Clemon also added, on the other side, the super rare brings you a ticket to the super highly rewarding kickoff super rare division. Just kidding there. But is there, like, I understand the idea that there's more utility because, like, you can use them in all the rare competitions. And if you don't have a lot of super rares, then, like, having, like, if you only had four super rares, then the added utility of using them in the super rare division is not there because you have to have a lineup now. And at least if you don't, unless you're playing two, Cap 220. Yeah. But so for how me, much do you put into that? That, like, the, the rares just have more utility? Short, short answer to that question, it depends, right? It depends on your gallery. If you're someone who's not playing the super rare division or the rare pro divisions or the unique divisions, a rare is going to give you more utility because you can't really use a super rare. And Tuggy said, Sean is seeing the importance of collection bows. I always I always was aware of the importance of collection bows, but I said it's, it's a minimal impact, like 1% to 2% is maybe going to decide things occasionally but most of the time one or two percent is not a super big impact but so for example in my gallery a super rare a very a good super rare carries a lot more value to me than a very good rare and i think i would say the same thing about nep's gallery i think he might obviously disagree based on his stance on this but a the thing is is like i can use a very good or a good super rare. I can use a good super rare in lots of competitions, right? Like I can use it in all my D2s, all my D3s, a D1 potentially, a cat mode type of situation, certain spots. I can use that card. Whereas like a very good rare, if it's like a, a card, like I'll give out Al Alvarado's them. We can use Alvarado. So like pretend he aged out because he aged out like tomorrow. So let's pretend he wasn't U23. That means every week, am I using him in Global All-Star Rare Pro? Probably not, because I have, like, Carlos Gill, who we know 
the GOAT. Uh, and then am I using him in America Rare Pro? Maybe. There's a good shot I use him in America Rare Pro. But if I don't, then he's stuck in a, in a rare division, which maybe isn't as bad as good of utility. Whereas if I have a good super, like let's say I have a Desart, right? I'm using a Desart super rare probably 95% of the weeks in lineups that are pretty decently strong. Whereas a, a very good rare, I'm using like most of the time, but sometimes in lesser priority lineups because that's just how it sort of fits. So I really think the answer to what Jonathan said is it depends on your gallery type uh, and where you're sort of putting stuff. What, what makes the Alvarado rare not that good? I didn't say it wasn't good. I said it, it's very good. But why wouldn't you use it in rare pro? Yeah, Carlos Gill takes up a mid spot, Laird. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can I, like looking at Haber's uh, also rare pro lineup, by the way, had he used one of pro probably the most obvious rare to put in there over his super rare Joao Paulo, he would have won. No, the most obvious rare would have been Gill. So, uh, I, I would have said Cecinia personally, because <clears throat> Cecinia is a lot, in my opinion, a lot better scorer than he'll at the moment. I like they had a much, consistently. They had a tough they had game a against Wissan, yeah. They had a worse matchup this week. They week's. had a really not great matchup. And but it, 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 it goes, it lends again to the point. Like, obviously, it's easy in hindsight to say, hey, put Cecinia in. But even Hill, I think Hill, I think Hill would have been the right option to play over Joao Paulo, even though he scored less, because. Joao Paulo, I don't think has, I don't think he's ever hit more than eighty points. I might be wrong, but he's he's on that kind of like sixty, even line, um, and Hill consistently hits higher. So if you if you, I know Haber's hit the podium, but if you're talking about winning, surely Hill was better over Joao Paulo there. Well, so here's the thing, right? Based on what you're saying, though, the answer wouldn't have been Cecinia over Joao Paulo. It would have been Cecinia over Tequino Suarez. Yeah. And it yeah, would have been Gil over Joao Paulo. Yeah. So if he, and if he did those two, if he did those two moves effectively, uh, I think I think they effectively scored the same when combined. But you miss out on the twenty percent, obviously. So if he did that, he would have scored like what thirteen um, percent worse or thirteen points worse. He would have been on like four thirty had he done that move. Yeah, and and but and then when factoring in the price, and this is what this is what I thought. The only thing I thought about coming into this com conversation is, if you're buying a a good super rare because you kind of can't afford great super rares, that price difference versus the lack of rewards is it isn't it just better anyway to have the the rare because you're having to pay so much more for Tiquinho and Joao Paulo. Actually, I think Haber got a pretty good deal on Tiquinho because it was before he, he fully started popping off. But I, I personally would rather... It's difficult, but I, I, if you can't get a really good super air, it's a punt for sure to put a good super air in there to get those high points. It's far less of a risk and I think would be more rewarding over time to have a very good rare in there. Instead of both super rares, like I, I think Tequino is actually a very, very good super rare, especially as a forward. Now that he's moved to Botafogo, he is like the, the pinnacle of their team. So I, I think Tequino is absolutely fine to have in there as a super rare. I think Joao Paulo is the one that I look at, and I think I wouldn't have. I, I personally would much prefer to have a, a a very, very good rare over Joao Paulo super rare. The thing is, is though, Tequino literally fits your exact definition of someone that doesn't crack 80, whereas Joao Paulo in the past has, granted it was pre-ACL tear. But Suarez has cracked 81 once in his sower journey, and he's just sort of a boomer. He's sort of one of those gets a goal or doesn't get a goal type guys. Um, but I actually, I was also wrong earlier when I said 13 points. It would have been, it would have been uh, 26. So it would have been like 13 each, so 26 or so. So... It just is a situation like both guys scored average. If you average Cecinia and Gill versus Tequino and Joao Paulo, they averaged like 60 to 65. But that 20% bonus gets you 20% on that uh, number instead of 26 points less. So I, I it, it's a difficult decision. I think that the real answer is that it probably ends up being a situation where it depends on the week and depends on the variance in the situation. If you have a 
if you have a good rare, a very good rare in the lineup and a good super rare as an option, but like the matchups, I think you kind of want to play matchups a bit. Yeah, I and agree if, with that, yeah. And you can sort of factor it in that way. But again, the whole premise here is that you lose the cap upside of the player. If you have that extra 20% and they do rip off 100, it plays so much more importantly. But it doesn't, does it? Because he he's a, he's three points away from first place. If Joao Paulo and Tequino got 100 each, doesn't matter how much into first place you are, you only need that points to get first place. Having an extra 40 points on top makes no difference. Yeah, but some weeks that that his score here is different. If he ran the other two compared to this, he puts up four seventeen. So what? Yeah, would he do does, a bit less. Up? But it, of course, as uh, I use this from Laird all the time, like you don't get those scores again, right? You've already had those scores, and in this game week particularly, in hindsight, Haber's made the absolute right choice. But historically, over let's say the last thirty games, how often would Cecinia and Hill? have scored better as a duo than Joao Paulo and Tequino. And I think it would be more often than not. I would agree that it's definitely more often than not. From Which from then the takes me to the point, is there actually a case that a very good rare is just better than a good super rare? Well, I think part of the issue with this, right, is Joao Paulo would be below the level that we were sort of talking about, maybe. But okay. I guess he's not. No. I mean, his L40 his no, is 59. No, he's just he been such play. a different player since he's come back from his ACL. He's been so much not as good. This is exactly the kind of player that we would be talking about. Yeah, that's fair. Is this Julian Desart or is this Joe Powell? Like, <laughs> no, it's, it's fair, Laird. It's very fair. I think the the only thing I want to point out is that he got, Haber got like peak, no, maybe not peak with Velasquez, but like this is Hoyos Velasquez combination. Like they were, like away underdogs like he got a penalty save to get to 92 points for Hoyo so like I don't necessarily think that the that Tiquinho and Jao Paulo coming up short I mean short is what we were considering that they could get because he got like peak outcomes from the other two does that make sense I swear that made sense in my head but as soon as it came out it didn't I'm like I'm not sure we're looking at this lineup at all if this penalty save doesn't happen. And that's not oh, something yeah. that you're going to like predict. Yeah. If the penalty save doesn't happen, you're not, you're not looking at that lineup at all. Cause it's right. like, a, it's like on 400, if that. I, th I think you could, uh, you could argue that for everything. You could, uh, if Tino didn't score a goal, we're not looking at his lineup, you know, the, uh, yeah, and, but... and that's, that again is where like mm -hmm. having the best players makes the biggest difference, right? Because, Hoyos is just a very good goalkeeper. You kind of expect good scores from him. Gerson, since he's moved back to Brazil, has been insane. And I wouldn't be surprised if he continually put up those massive scores of like 90 pluses. And so I think the three that he's got there is like you are, you're you banking on them scoring good because I think it's good. You know, he's got the good combination, the good synergy with the defender goalkeeper and Gerson is just a beast. So I don't like... You know, some some game weeks you get the assist from a goalkeeper. Like some game weeks you get uh, That's fair. like like today, like this game week for me that ruined my life. Nishikawa scoring an own goal and getting an error that led to goal in one of the most hilarious things I've ever seen in football, even by Asia League standards. Um, <laughs> it was just atrocious, and it like you can't really factor in the anomalies because you never know when they are or aren't going to happen. So I, I I know I know what you're trying to say in your head. Like if if they score what they normally score, it doesn't make a difference. But I actually think that's where the rares make a bigger difference because if Jerson and Hoyos Hoyos specifically score what they normally score, Haber's not on podium. Whereas if he actually had two incredible rare cards, he may well be back on podium because he's got the guys that always perform at that top end rare level. If that makes sense. Also, also, I just want to clarify for everyone too that the, the advice I gave to Nep, which was very on brand, that you guys need to to hear here. I told Nep to just go buy an Alvarado Super Rare. He did indeed. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was that was my advice to Nep in this situation. In, instead, I decided to invest in a 2022 Fine Old Collection. There you so, go. Yeah, but yeah, that, that I just had to make sure that I gave everyone knew that I'm on brand with my advice giving. That is my favorite 
part of like piece of advice that you give when somebody's like, I have this really good rare. And you're like, no, no, just buy the super rare. Yep. Like just spend. And they're like, oh yeah, but it's going for eight X more. And you're like, yeah, yeah, just get it. It's, if it's a super, you should just get it. It's a great, it's a great piece of advice. I mean, honestly, it's, it's really, really strong. I've been, I'll tell you who definitely scores better than Alvarado rare. Alvarado super rare. <laughs> yeah, that is, now that I can't argue. We cannot argue yeah. that one. Yeah. But just, so, so I also went into, and I, I think it's something that's valid and, and something, again, that you only learn as you play or you don't learn and you just carry on sucking, which I also do quite a lot. But you only learn as you play is, is like what you say, like with matchups, Sean, right? It's like, for example, like Hector Herrera at home or Hoffman at home is almost guaranteed 100 points. It's He scores 100 more than he doesn't, which is wild at home. And so as as a in the discussion we had, as I mentioned, like I honestly think that taking six or 700 pounds and buying three or four rares that are demons at home and having the ability to play matchups is better than having one like good super rare. But if he's got a bad matchup, too bad, you've got to use him. If he's if he's injured, too bad. Like you can't use him. I I think having that ability is way more valuable for somebody that would be looking to buy a good super rare. Yeah, if it's one of those things that if you have a limited gallery, and I, I'm a big fan of of depth, right? I use depth frequently with my gallery. You'll see random weird kind of players um, in my lineups. And and Luis just said SFI results are 80 percent matchups 20 percent luck in some cases agreed there's just like some matchups where like guys are just not really going to fail like their failure in certain spots is like they're going to get 70 without a decisive and with a decisive they're on 100 so like they're playing matchups is very important the the type of superers i would recommend getting is someone who's just going to be very very strong frequently but it, it actually goes to the same point so one of the the favorite way and the most recommended by me way to create lineups and build lineups for a rare pro division is buy goalie and super rare defender combinations because you can typically get them relatively cheap. You can play matchups. Like one of my favorite is Robin Cropper. We've talked about it many times, but you can go out there, you can go buy Robin Cropper super. It's never going to be that expensive. And when he's at home, he sits there and they don't concede at home. And Robin Proper's L40 at home is 63. And you could get his super rare for like 0.4. So what you want to do is you want to have like understall Robin Proper. You want to have next person super rare defender that does the same thing. You want to have next person super rare defender that does the same thing. And then like Nepenthes is talking about here, you go and you can sit there and you can find matchups Typically, if you have three or four combinations of things, then you're going to have a good matchup somewhere, right? Like if you have four guys and I'm, you're not buying like a, a stack of like Emin, right? Like you're buying like 20, who's a pretty good team. You're buying like Antwerp, who's a pretty good team. And or you're, you're buying teams that are pretty good, but maybe not as like cheat code types as like what IAX was in the past uh, and stuff like that. So to me, that's my favorite way to do it. Plus, plus by doing it this way, you always have additional goalies to play in different competitions, which is usually a blocker for people to do. You always are going to have a goalie that has a good matchup the same week your defender has a good matchup. And you don't have to break the bank. So, like, for example, this year when Grimaldo was, like, 2E. And that was actually the person our last conversation was about. Or it was, yeah. similar was Grimaldo. But, like, Grimaldo Super at the time was, like, 2E, right? And Neff was like, I don't really want to buy that because that's a lot. I'd rather get Robin Proper for 0.4, get the next Robin Proper for 0.4, get the next Robin. And you basically do it four different ways because there's two reasons, right? When you have four, it buys you more lineups. It will typically give you the ability to play another rare pro or a super rare division or another. It'll give you ability to play more competitions because you have more goalies, you have more super rare defenders, so you can play more stuff. Also, you can pick matchups. You can find, oh, wow, uh, 20's at home against Camber. Well, they're going to smash. He's going to have like 70, 80 points, and if he gets a decisive, probably has a shot of 100. So you can sit there and play matchups. Now, maybe you can't get as good of peak scores as what you can get consistently from Grimaldo, because even in some situations like at home with um, with Robin Proper, you maybe won't get as good of a matchup. But like, if I look through it, right, like they played, they played Sparta, put up 67 at home, played – 
Kieran Bean put up 89 at home. Played Camber, had 65 at home. Played Volendam, had 100. Played Emin, had 80. Like, you can be pretty sure he's going to have a good game. So that's a good way to do it. And then also the best thing about it is, let's say you buy Grimaldo Super and Grimaldo tears his ACL. You're fucked. You're just, you're screwed. Whereas if you buy three, four different stacks of guys, all right, Robin Proper tears his ACL. All right, well, that sucks, but I have three other options to still use. No, I, I, I agree with that. By buying, having depth, having matchups, I definitely think is good, which is why I've gone for all collections. I've got three limited so far, working on the second rare, because I think by, by my outlook anyway, is like first game of the season, Arsenal are home to Nottingham Forest in theory, should be a walkover. So I'm going to be walking in, assuming no Arsenal cards have been minted, with like 17 or 18% on my Arsenal res, and that should win, like Champion Europe rare, it should, in theory. Of course, in practice, it's considerably more challenging, but in theory, you know, that should win. And then I've also got the final stack, led itching to say something i can see in his face um then i'm then i'm working on the final stack and you know they, they don't have uh too many transfers in and out proposed for this summer which means i've got the core group and they should slap many many times next season but if there's like a super rare that i've got that's got an insane matchup that's not like an insane player like um i don't know brandon vasquez or some other rando super rare that i've got like lucardia is playing bottom of the csl or something all of a sudden, all-star rare pro with like three Arsenal players and two super rares that could absolutely bang certainly makes more sense. Um, the stumbling block, I think, for a lot of people is having the funds in the first place to buy one super rare, let alone multiple like half stacks of super rares is, is challenging. And then like there's this thing that happens on so rare now that everyone everyone experiences it, but you you like like there was a guy on on the market for like a hundred hundred pounds and i offered the guy like 90 pounds and he rejected and then he immediately cancelled his listing and put it up to like 130 pounds because he thinks oh there's interest in this now so i can get more for it and it's like i wasn't willing to pay what you had it listed for before neither was anybody else yet now you're trying to hold me hostage and with super airs because people recognize how scarce they are that happens like even more and people try to extort you for average super rares and i think again it, it kind of creates a real a real bad environment in that market to the point where just going and buying a rare again is just just worth more just in, in like even even in just that regard of like negotiating and, and getting the piece that you want is just easier okay i have like three things to say go for it <laughs> the first nobody's buying a robin proper super rare for 0.4 right now so I wanted to go back to that. Okay. No you chance. always say this, but then it's like, it's not far It's, off it's the that. theory. It's literally not even, that. yeah. It's not remotely close. It's, the second it one, I was going to say, in before Arsenal beat Nottingham Ford a 7-1, and that one is what actually ends up killing your stack and not the, not the rest of it, which is really just the worst way to lose, and it happens to me all the time anyway. But uh, the other one was the way, everything that you described there, it's just easier to buy the rare that doesn't make it a better play though. Like it doesn't make like it not either. <clears throat> What's that? Doesn't make it not a better play. Absolutely. Either. Absolutely. But it, it kind of reminded me of a while ago when I don't even remember which show it was, but we were talking about stacking and how, when you have a full stack, like it's easier because you only have to track one team and you know, they're all playing at the same time. Presumably they're all doing it. And Namzo made some comment like, do you want to, do you want it to be easier or do you want to win? And not to say that stacking, that you can't win with stacking, but it does feel like part of the super rare discussion is like, it's just hard to get these cards. And I think we end up saying like, we come up with these excuses of, well, you know, you can play the rare in more places and I can buy three rares instead of this super rare. And then I can just play the matchups, assuming that like one of the three have a good matchup. Like it's possible one situation they all have good matchups and now you have to choose one of the three and it's just as easy to pick one that doesn't end up getting the result that you want and in the super rare you know if you pay it for the super rare you're, you're forced to play it because you're like well that's the card i have but 
it just seems like we we're building in like ease in the, to a situation that may not actually lead you to make the optimal decision. Cause you're just like, it's easier for me to get three super three rares that are very good. So I'm just going to do that as opposed to the super that like actually might be more beneficial to my yeah, I mean, I mean, like we're talking about the optimal decision though. The optimal decision is to not play SO5 at all and to trade, right? So we're already making suboptimal decisions just by playing yeah, SO5. But I don't even want to, like, I think that's the more profitable way to, to participate in so rare, but like, we're not talking about that. Like we're, we're not, none of us are here for, well, I was gonna say none of us are here to actually make money, but none of us are here to maximize ROI because if that was the case, then we would be trading. Like I think- Yeah, no, hundred percent. No, I, I, I certainly like, I understand what you say. And I actually looked at stacking way back uh, about a year or so ago when the new European started last season and everybody was like, oh no, like the Zenit stacks are going to ruin the game and the Ajax stacks are going to ruin the game. And it, like, they just didn't ultimately they they just weren't that strong and i started to like kind of deep dive a little bit more into why stacking was literally suboptimal and it's because first of all you need the team to have a good performance generally speaking and second of all you then need to somehow pick out the five top scorers of an 11 player team assuming that they will start which is quite challenging in itself the year that's gone by especially now that collection bonus exists which as i said to you last time we spoke led i think it's being overlooked significantly especially at limited and rare level the, the more you learn about a team and it's way easier with one team the more you learn about some of the key points that sean talks about quite often is like who's taking sets but deeper than who's taking sets who's on the end of those sets because it's actually quite obvious when watching houston the um the center back not Sviachenko, the other guy i can't remember his name now ends with an m but he's the guy that hector herrera always always aims for which means now i'm going to be having clark him and hector herrera definitely in my lineup and then amin bassi as well because he's a penalty taker and i've got on on a like when houston pop off i know that those four are going to be involved 100 percent, not 100 percent, but you know i can hedge my bets then the fifth is like the anomaly player and you kind of just got to get the the luck with that but now looking at stacks if you really learn the way the team plays and the synergy within players themselves as well, you can kind of isolate the best matchups within matchups. And I think stacking is going to prove to be incredibly efficient next year, which is why I'm investing my money into it. And you think it is more beneficial to have a five rare stack of a single team than a three rare, two super rare of that team? Not necessarily. Um, I've, I've, I'm still going to be, so I'm for my next season, for the next European season, uh, limited and rare level, I've, I'm going to build, I've obviously got the Arsenal collection more as like, I just love Arsenal and I want those guys more than anything. Yeah. I've gone for final to have a challenge Europe team. And I'm also going to build two second division Europe rare teams as well. And success will be defined as making 100% return on investment or uh, not having negative return on investment if I sold the whole team. So even if like I only win, you know, twenty percent of rewards, but the team's still worth eighty five percent, that would be deemed as not failure, maybe not success. Yeah. I will still have my All Star Rare Pro and Super Rare lineups, where it's like best matchups, best cards, best options to try and win. Um, because I, I want to see, I want to take a whole season to actually look back and say, did this strategy work? Not this didn't work for three game weeks in a row which is we, you know, when we looked at the best team, if you put the best 5L15 guys up there, more often than not, they don't win a reward or don't win. And so if that's seen as failure, then, then you can fail with having a full, you know, a full, a full stack as well. But I, I think when you win, especially with collection bonus, and then more specifically a rare level, nobody can beat you. It's impossible. And unless they've just got a different stack that has higher base points overall, in terms of XP and percentage wise, just no one can beat you. And I, I like that feeling of knowing that there will be, without any shadow of a doubt, a handful of game weeks at least that Arsenal just absolutely slay their opponents in this upcoming season. And I'll, I'll be there for that. And if I can get 100% return on investment on that team and then use that to build into the tier above and 
then next season do the same thing and play a long game with it rather than a short, like short term, like his, you know, I've invested, I don't know, five ETH. Oh no, I've only won like 0.3 ETH in two months. This is a failure. That That's how a lot of people look. Then they panic. Then they switch strategies. Exactly what I've been doing. I want to give something a bit, a bit of time. And I think sacking is the way to enjoy this game now at a level where it could be fun, cost effective, and easy. Long term thinking on so rare. Yeah, it's wild. I know it is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you picture yourself playing five rare Arsenal stacks in rare pro? If the matchup's right, yeah. Well, well, if if the matchup's right, and then I don't have a super rare that also has an insane matchup. Like if I've got a super rare that's got a triple A matchup, and I've got the Arsenal stack, it then it would just be stupid to not play the super rare, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's more just making sure it doesn't. You're not like forcing the stack just because it's the stack. So the stack's going to go into rare, not rare pro. But if you think the if you think the lineup can win rare, presumably it has a very good chance to win rare pro because the points yeah. at the oh, top right, are not right, all yeah. that different. Oh, you, yeah. You might have just convinced me to put it into rare pro. Yeah. I didn't mean to do that. You are right. I, I, you are absolutely right. Right, more of like I I don't know if you have the kind of like one for one data, but it would be interesting to see how many times a team put into rare would have won the equivalent rare pro division because I think it's more often than it doesn't. Yeah, we um we did that a while ago. I should look at that because somebody actually brought that up also earlier about the success of like uh, five rare, four rare, one super rare, and three rare, two super rare um, lineups in rare pro. I remember the. The data from that was basically like more two super rare lineups win, but it's because the best rare lineup, like five rare lineups are not actually entered in rare pro. So exactly what you were saying, if we had like one leaderboard of the two competitions together and how many are would were from the rare versus rare. Well, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So, so question for Nap since this is, I believe a changed viewpoint from you. Do you believe the rare pro competition is far better than the rare competition at this current state? Yeah. I, I think I did always before. I've, I've just, like, you know, when I play FIFA, the rags to riches is what I live for. And it doesn't, like, it's difficult for me, even like that Haney Mukhtar Super that I picked up, it's difficult to pay that much money for a card. Like, it's it's just crazy. Like, it's a lot of money for a card. And I would rather... For example, like build a rare team, win some cards, sell them off to then buy a super rare uh, on like so rare's dime effectively, and then like I'm you know I'm free rolling. So I, I if it if it fails, it didn't cost me anything. But you come to learn very quickly on so rare that winning in its first instance is difficult enough. But then as you win and you get a player. You don't think, let me sell this player so I can put it towards like a real good super rare. You think, what team can I build around this player for next week? And it's, well, that's how I think anyway. And so I, I, I prioritize rare. I, I, I've done it all wrong, right? I, 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 I know for a fact, if I had my time on so rare again, I would do it completely differently because I, I invested heavily into limiteds when they were at top price. And the idea was I'll win off of limiteds and use that to go into rares. And then limited start crashing. So I invested heavily into rares with that same idea of like, I'll win loads of rares, you know, I'll win a Messi, sell him for 10 grand, win an Mbappe, sell him for 30 grand, and I'll build into super rares. And if I had just taken it all from the very, very beginning and invested just in super rares, I would probably have like an incredibly better gallery with way more rewards and way more return on investment. But you don't, you can't, you, you have to go through that to learn that. You can't, like, even if somebody tells you stone cold with evidence, this will fail. This is like the kind of like blueprint to succeed. I would have still been like, no, I can do it the other way. I don't, I don't know if playing only super rares would have gotten you where you think you would go. Well, playing rare pro would have. Yep. But you need rare to do that. Yeah. If you, if you did, if you did super rares and then elite rares for rare pro would have definitely been. Yes. Why, why wouldn't super rares have been successful? D two prize pools were just horrendous. Yeah, you can't you can't win the best cards in the super rare division. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, they're better. It, so so, okay. so here's something. So I talked about this on a stream before, right? 
everyone wants to win Mbappe. And we, I think we briefly touched on this on a conversation before and why, right? So when you say you can't win the best cards, that, that's like, that's very much like your perspective of what winning is, right? If I've invested 30, 40 ETH and I play in a super A division and it's way easier to just win in general because the points are lower because everyone's targeting all star rare pro, I don't care if it's the best card as long as it has some value for me to sell. If I'm, if I'm hitting podiums and getting that ETH return, and then getting the super rares. And I think they started throwing some rares in after that as well, on, as well as the super rare. As long as I'm recouping the investment to build down, I would have I would have very quickly hit into the rare pro divisions anyway, because I would have just had excess funds. Yeah. yeah up that, until six, no, how, when was it? Up until like four months ago, you couldn't win shit in super division unless you finished on the podium. Like if you didn't finish on the podium, you were lucky to win a card worth like 0.1. Yeah, uh, well, I think the, like what you were saying, if you, you know, the idea was you play rares, you win the messy rare to sell for 10 grand, you win Mbappe to sell 30, you cannot win that level of card in yeah. a super rare playing a super rare division. But you're right, no, you can win a I bunch of it. When building up the pyramid though, you need to win the most expensive things because it costs more to move up a level. But if you start... Okay, let's ignore the uniques. If you start on that second tier of the pyramid, building down is it's just a lot easier because yes. you don't need as, as much funds, right, to, to buy down. So that's the like logic behind it. At a rare level when it's limited level, I need to win the most expensive cards to build up more. But at super level, I just need to win. So I'm looking the prize pool, which I don't think is that different when the European schedule is gone, but the top two places in All Star Super Rare this like past game week. First place gets a tier one super rare and a tier two rare. Second place gets a tier two super rare and a tier two rare. If you only played the super rare division, I have I can see this conversation with Sean already happening. And you're like, I won all these rares. And he's like, the rares aren't good enough for rare pro. Like your rares shouldn't be tier twos in the in rare pro. Like you, yeah. you want to play yeah, star. Yeah. And so eventually you're gonna to have to buy rares. Yeah, but you could buy that from rare like pro. Like, what, what was the total value of, like, first place, ETH, and then the two cards? Probably. On average? You're, you're probably capped right now at if you win D2 gas at, like, two ETH. Like, two ETH it, could buy me some incredible stars. But that's, level. that's like, th again, this has changed. In the past, it was, like, you were capped at, like, one and a half, and after third place, you were capped at, like, 0.3 ETH. So you would have been better off winning, like, a tier two rare for, like, 0.1 ETH instead. Yeah. But 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 then we look at like what's the points for first place? In global and that gas two, they're quite high. Gas two typically is pretty high. But they're they're pretty high because everybody's got twenty percent on top. Like and the, then a the base bonus scores as well. are, are lower. Yeah than yeah lower. yeah. Base scores you probably yeah you need to average like less. It's like you don't have to average like seventy five. You can average like sixty. And that's 70. where I think the good super rares have signi like a good value, right? Because your Desarts and your Joao Paulos are Correct. good enough. Which is why when you asked me the question, would I rather have a Desart yeah. Super Rare or an Alvarado Rare, I would rather have a Desart Super Rare because I will always have a spot for a 60 average Super Rare uh, every week. Whereas like Alvarado Rare, I'm going to have a spot, but it's going to be less important than than where I am. I need to check to see what... Uh, but the I'm, Desart... I'm, so the Desart Super, like for you... The Desart Super Rare is more valuable because you're like, oh, I'll just play it in the Super Rare division. Correct. But if you're somebody front going from Rare to Rare Pro, is that still a good card? I think probably we went through and I gave my reasons why, but I definitely see the other side of the spectrum on that. I think that you could make a case for both. Because like, if you look at them, Desart doesn't have tons of 80 pluses, right? But the way I look at it is if you score an 80 plus as a Super Rare, a Rare cannot realistically beat you because you're getting the bonuses that push you to a point where, which the rare can't be. If you score like 70 to 80, basically the super, a rare can match you. If they can't really beat you, they can match you. And then obviously as you go below that, it starts making it more, more and more up in it, the air and up in question. But I think there is a lot of merit for both sides of things uh, in that situation. But yeah, again, like I said, a lot of it depends on gallery size. My gallery, 100% Desart. I think Nepenthes' gallery is also Desart. For, he has a lot of rares. He has a lot of other guys. Laird, 
your gallery is actually probably to start too. But once you start getting into someone that really doesn't play, if you if you are not playing super rare at all, it makes more sense for Alvarado. Because like once, let's say I play super rare divisions, right? And I'm playing all the super rare divisions. So like all of a sudden you have at least five spots a week that you can use to start. If you're playing super rare divisions. Actually, so like let's hypothetically say you're playing like every division up to a certain level. Let's say that you're playing uh, up through super rare, right? So you're playing all super rares, all rares, all limiteds. You can then play to start in five spots in D2. You can play them in five spots in D3. That is also five times five is 25. That's five times two is 10. So you get 35 spots you can use to start. If you are not playing the Super Rare Division, you only have 10 spots you can play to start because uh, you're just limited. You, you can only play them. Actually, no, it's actually less. It's, you can only play them in two spots. So you can, because you only play them in uh, All Star Rare Pro, all, and then his Regional Rare, rare Pro. Well, and yeah. In the, yeah. Caps, in the three right? caps. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't, you can't play him if you're not playing Super Rares. You can't play him in yeah, so you get two, two spots. You could play him in two spots. Yeah. You play him in rare pro of each of his regional and an all star, and then yeah, I guess you can play cap 220 with with it because you can play like a rare goalie. So like in theory, if you're playing super divisions, you can put the star in 35 different holes because you have to have 35 super rares to play those. If you play to start in uh, and you only play rares and rare pros, you only have six possible landing spots for to start. So it just limits the amount of options to go with the Desart. So I think it just depends on your gallery type and, and what your preference is with galleries and where you would want uh, between Desart and Alvarado. Everyone in chat is now asking if they're, they have a Desart super rare gallery too, which is really fit. It's good. That's the new, uh, it's like, oh, how's his gallery? Well, he could use a Desart super rare. That would fit in there. That'd be good. I was looking at the, so part of my thought on this was I wonder if we were basically using two outliers, like, is Alvarado too cheap? Or are both players basically too cheap for like what they do? Like, I feel like Alvarado. Yeah. Like, I think the argument that, that Nep had was like, well, I could buy like three Alvarados for the price. Well, I don't know if it's that many. Two Alvarados rares for the price of a Desart Super Rare. And if that's the case, I would rather have multiple options. Correct. Um, and so I pulled up like the similar players of the two and Granted, this is just like comparing by L15, but the Alvarado comparables are absurd. It's Romelu before he got hurt, Kimmich, Von is like literally the best players on the platform. To Johnny and, Reinders, baby. Woo! But I'm like, you're not getting these guys, Romelu, you will now. But like, you're not getting these guys for Alvarado's price. So yeah, it's not like you're getting two Alvarados for the price of a Desar. Well, you, so, you so to... Alvarado comes with like at risk, his league, the utility just got lost. He's using under 23. Which I think influences his price a bit as well. But my point actually when I was talking to Sean about it in the Discord was not necessarily, and, and this is why it'd be great to have the ability to search L15's home and away on SD is because I'd love to see the comparison of prices. Like Hector Herrera, if you go to him right now, his rare is probably cheaper than Alvarado's. And yet his home scores for Houston are wild. And it's like, I, I would take Hector Herrera at home every day of the week ahead of if, if you just go year to date as well just so it does this this uh this season only that's incredible yeah i would take that rare at home every single day of the week over this home away or matchup i a, also a 68 by the way a 68 average that includes two red cards yeah well yeah. What, one of the 68 scores he got was with a red card yeah it would have been another hundred on the board if he didn't hit that that red I also think too, and Nepenthes, correct me if I'm wrong here, but oh, part that. of your issue is with Desart's lack of peak scores. If you gave Desart more 80 pluses, but then had more of his 60s turn into 40s, you would probably prefer Desart, correct? 100%, yeah. 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 So the issue is, is from a stability standpoint, like Desart's very stable, but lacks the high end scores, where if we turn to start into someone I, I'll use, I mean, someone we've talked about before, but let's go to Pedro Gonzalez, Laird. And if you turn to start into Pedro Gonzalez, they have a similar 
L40, but the peaks are much more high on Gonzalez and the floors are a lot lower. So like if the, if I split Desart to Gonzalez, right, you're taking Gonzalez every day over Alvarado rare. Gonzalez super rare. Yeah, yeah, Gonzalez super rare. hundred oh, percent. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So that's what super that's rare. a good example of what people what what. Isn't a Gonsalves super rare like worth like ten Alvarado? Uh, I think it's just a theoretical points it's, versus yeah. like if if Desar had like another like five or six or like eighty plus scores, correct? Would I be taking him his super rare at point four or even just in general as like a good super rare? But I I, I, I do think that yeah that maybe then pushes him into not being a good super rare anymore and being a very good or great super rare. But I, I think one of the things that I kind of learned myself through talking to you uh, the other day, Sean, was like. I never looked at this until I started breaking it down to get actual like percentage data. Yeah. But I wonder how valuable it could be looking at people's 80 to 90 and 90 to 100 score chart over like an L40 and just matching those guys up instead because you could you could easily win some divisions if you've got guys that regularly are putting in those scores. And I've never looked, even though I've looked at that graph before, I've never really looked at it as like from an analytical point of view of like, Hey, this guy's only ever hit 190 in his career. So yeah. I'm never really going to win anything like with him in there. Um, and it was it was just fascinating to me to like look at that. And it would be another cool feature to like search by number of 80 plus points in the last 15 or, or 40 games. Because I think it would open up a lot more scouting opportunities and a lot more players that people could pick up on a budget, like a Hoffman, where it's like, okay, he, he doesn't score great especially away from home and then sometimes at home as well but he has more 100s on the platform than like 99.5 percent of the platform and that's that could be an incredibly useful piece for somebody playing on a budget um or, or, or just building a gallery where they don't have to fork out like crazy crazy scores because yeah look, i mean look at those like uh, that's that's incredible isn't it and now he's got some low points and one of my viewers made a point to me the other day of like i have too many players that have a really low floor and i could use a lot more players that have a much higher floor and i think that's where desart falls in it's like he might not ever like give you that 100 points but he's never gonna ruin your lineup right you're never gonna come away from his score and be like damn man another like he's dropped to 28 and it's like it, it's finding that that personal strategy and that personal choice of what, what are you looking for? Are you looking to have that, that one game week, like maybe um, I don't know, like quarter or two months or whatever, where you've got your guys hitting a big hundred? Or have you got, or are you looking to have a consistent chance of winning rewards every single week with the guys that are hitting like 60 plus? And that's, that's quite challenging because if you, you could have some game weeks where like he hits 100. And another guy in your lineup hits 100. But if you've got these guys that have low floors but high ceilings, if the other three are hitting like 30s or 40s, you're also not winning anything. Yeah. yeah well, I, I so yeah. I think Laird Laird marks up and Vitali brings it up pretty well. And he he asks, does this sum it up? If you want reward to reward consistently, you need a high floor, hence high average. If you want to win, you need to have a high ceiling. So part of the disconnect here too is is depending on where people play. So if you're playing limiteds, you need to just rip high scores. Like you need ceilings, right? If you play rare, you need ceilings. If you're playing rare pro, that's getting up to a point where a little bit more consistency is okay. Super rares, consistency is a lot better. Uniques, consistency is very good to some extent. Um, but just, just to like go back to the point on Gonzalez, because you said like he's way more expensive. Like go look at Wakazaka. And let's see what Nepenthes thinks about him. Because he's very comparable from a price for Desart, very similar scores, but done in a different way. Um, and then another disconnect to that I think people have. So uh, we'll look at Wakazaka and then I'll talk about that a little bit. I, um, I still think it's a little tough going, comparing different regions. Like that's that was one of the issues I had with Desart and is. Alvarado. Like nobody's going to play, like Alvarado is cheaper because he plays in America. Correct. And Wakizaka is cheaper because he plays in Japan. These are guys you're playing Global All Star though, so like it's kind of comparable. Not, not in October. Well, true. Not in October. April. Like it's. But anyways, back to like the discussion you guys are having, and and people people think that there's luck involved with with Sober. Hundred percent there is. But 
people think everything is, is a luck situation, right? If you are sitting there and we have a Jonas Hoffman, since we've been talking about Jonas Hoffman, right? You can feel pretty good that if they are playing Bayern Munich away, he's likely not going to be that great. Like that's likely a game where Jonas Hoffman's going to put up one of his worst games. Whereas if you flip side and you used to be, oh, they're playing Augsburg at home, you can feel a lot more likely that that's going to be a situation that's going to be positive. So it's a situation where, yes, there's obviously luck involving with stuff. People can fail all the time in bad matchups. People can succeed. I mean, I saw Tati Castellanos have a, like five goals against Real Madrid. <laughs> like, there's just spots where variance is going to kick in and it's going to happen. But you can also look and be like, wow, this matchup's really good. I think that it's a favorable play. I, I'm going to bump this guy up in priority list. Or you're going to look and be like, wow, this guy sucks. Yeah, I, I'm aware he had 100 against Bayern. Hey, it was Bayern, at home, though. Right? It was at home. It was at it home. It actually there. proves that the home the home thing with Jonas Hoffman is more powerful than anything else. Correct. But I think that there's a lot of merit into different matchups and different viewpoints you can have with things. Like, if you're looking properly at matchups, you're going to have a idea of, like, oh, this is a good matchup. Oh, this is a bad matchup. Like, and you don't even need, like, Vegas or anything to tell you, like, oh, this is a good matchup, this is a bad matchup. You have an idea of what bad matchups are in league. Like, if I'm in the Riviera VC, okay, away at 20, bad matchup. Away at Ajax, bad matchup. Away at Feyenoord, bad matchup. Home versus Camber, good matchup. Home versus Go Ahead Eagles, good matchup. Like, you can get ideas of, like, what is good and bad without really putting much effort into it. That's fair. <clears throat> yeah. You just got to buy a ton of cards. That's all. Yeah. I mean, it, but it's, it's a true, it's a, some people like to have a very efficient gallery, but my viewpoint on like an efficient gallery where you just don't have very many players, it's actually really inefficient because you then have lots of holes that just aren't really plugged properly because you have not enough players to, to realistically plug them. The more players you have, more options you have options on sober are huge every single week because every single week you play different teams in different matchups and therefore you can sit there and cherry pick good matchups versus bad matchups and it's it's very helpful yeah i think that's simplifying it a little too much though because anytime we were doing like gallery reviews and somebody was like yeah i have a really deep gallery blah blah and be like all right you should take all of these cards and sell them to get right. a carlos heel and so there is a point where, like, I think you need to have a certain level of quality before you can build out the depth. You need to have a, a Desart super rare gallery in order to be able to have enough, like, depth to, to make sure that you can play matchups. Like, I don't think it's just as simple, like, yeah, just get as many cards as you can because if they're not good cards, and we're not saying, like, go out and buy bad cards, but there are plenty of people who have very deep galleries and you're kind of like, you don't have enough good cards that play. You need to get rid of them. And so they do that. And it's like, oh, well, you should also get some more because you need depth. But that's that's a nice thing. Like, we, There's been lots of discussions about baseball and basketball product that I've seen recently. And part of the difference between the, the products, right, is the, is is the football product. We literally sit here and every single week I could come up with like five to ten players. I like, man, I really want to go buy them basketball baseball you just look at and you're just like yeah there's not really anyone i can do so xmk productions said it's worth checking the betting odds for a better idea of matchups. 100 if you don't understand betting and sports betting and stuff like that and you don't understand the matchups it's a great way to start if i sit there like so i'll give an example tomorrow if you're not familiar with international soccer which a lot of people are right you don't know who gibraltar is and all of a sudden, France plays Gibraltar. And you're like, all right, France plays. They're a good team. Cool. You don't know how lopsided that matchup is, right? So in the Gold Cup on the middle of the week, the USA plays St. Kitts. USA is a, like four and a half goal favorite. If you are a four and a half goal favorite, the amount of club games that are a four and a half goal favorite uh, on the season is about zero. Zero. You're like, you will not get that except for maybe in the Champs League or something. If like Sheriff ends up in there and you play like Real Madrid, right? Like maybe it gets that high, but it's almost never. So like all of a sudden, like if you are a four and a half goal favorite, you are going to have a majority of the ball. 
the other team is typically not very good. So you're going to have a lot of chances to score, to get final third passes, get long passes into the opposition half. You're just going to rack up points. And what people don't understand is like, yeah, goals and assists are, are variable. Like you might not, like I might play Jesus Ferrer and he might not score, but whoever's starting for the, for the USA sure is shit going to have opportunities. Uh, and yes, I know that uh, Sheriff won against Real Madrid. That's really? <laughs> Well, I use that as the, I wasn't going to say it, but I'm, I'm yeah. glad someone did. That's why, that's why I use it as the example. But you can be pretty confident that in those games, like they're going to have a lot of the possession. And if you just sit there and you make final third passes all game, you're going to put up a huge score. It's just how it is. That's how the matrix works. So using betting odds is very helpful in determining what the matchups are. Uh, and then uh, KB asked if the pick score indicated it. Yes, it is involved with the pick score as well. And it is helpful, but like a lot, like for me, like I will sit there and I will look at my lineup. So tonight, if I go to the line of builder, so I'm going to the line of builder on my screen right now, and I'm looking at all-star rare pro. And if you look at the win percentage, so river play in this midweek coming up has 86% chance to win that game and a 10% to draw 4% to lose. That means River Plate's probably like a two, two and a half goal favorite in that game. So I can feel pretty confident River Plate's going to have a lot of possessions, a lot of the ball, a lot of opportunities in the other team's final third. So I'm pretty confident River Plate guys are going to score pretty well. You must not have a lot of River Plate cards. You never yeah. go in confidently. Come on. Well, I've, I've yeah, already yeah. had a triple A matchup last week and conceded inside <laughs> yeah. one minute. <laughs> well, hey, goalie, goalie is different in that situation because if your goalie is a massive favorite, they're going to either get like 62 or 30. Yeah. Because they're yeah. not going to see anything in yeah. like basic passes. Oh. Um, I have, I um, to, somebody was bringing it up, but basically. We were talking about that you want to get guys with peak scores. And so if you're not paying top price for the elite guys, let's talk about the super rares. And so you need to find players that do hit their peaks. Obviously those players also can struggle a lot. Otherwise they, they would be the elite ones, but having five of them, or I'll even say three of them, like taking out the goalkeeper and, and at least one defender, like, is there, this is, I think this goes to the Desart part of the conversation that like you can't have that much confidence rolling in three highly volatile attackers unless they just happen to have like the ideal, like their river plate this week and Jesus Ferreira. Like, does it make more sense to have a guy like Desart than it is to try to roll out three like highly volatile players? Super level, I think so. Again, right. maybe it depends on your division, right? If you're in D two, you've got you know a striker that either hits thirty or or seventy. Yeah, no, I probably still would go with somebody that I'm like to start because again, in that level, you've definitely got that ability. Be like sixty points is probably enough, right? Like base three hundred points plus bonuses is probably enough for a reward. Um, but I think at rare pro level. Like I, I have, I go for the volatile players because again, I'm a dreamer, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to buy this guy and he's not going to be volatile anymore. He's just going to be legit forever. And then they're just not, you know, and like Gustavo Bo is like injured all the time. He's back for two matches and then gets taken off for precautionary tightness in his hamstring. And it's like, he's out for another five games, isn't he? You just know he's going to be right. And I, I love that kind of guy because when it comes together, it feels so much more satisfying than having the best ones. But because it doesn't come together enough, it's also so much more demoralizing than just winning consistently at a lower level. I think I don't know. It's it, it, again it, that theory. Like, like, a, do, would you rather just have a way higher floor and win tier fours and tier threes continuously, or a really erratic player but you know hit a podium every now and then? It's, it's just funny. I'm going to take this opportunity to talk since Sean muted himself. <laughs> the you. What you just described, you were like, I want I want it to all come together is the opposite of what you were saying if you had just played super rare. You were like, if I just bought in super rares and whatever I win will be good enough and I'll just like churn rewards. Yeah. But the like the lower down you go, you're just like, no, no, I don't want that. Yeah. I want to win the top. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So so I think that there's 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 a balancing act, right? 
and and I think it goes for like rare pro too. I, I think once you get to rare and limited, it's like you're just like you got to rip ninety plus points or like eighty plus points. Like you got to put up huge scores. But there's a balancing act between guys that are incredibly high floor because if someone has an incredibly high floor, if this guy is just going to get you sixty to sixty five points every single game week, he still has a ten to twenty percent chance to get you to a hundred. Like we talk, we're talking about Desart. Like Desart still can get you there. But he's likely going to keep your lineup afloat regardless. So if you sit there and you all of a sudden you have Messi and Neymar and Grimaldo, and you're like, these guys are all going to rip 100s. And I either have this guy that's just a total dumpster that it like could put up 100 or could put up 30, or it's like I can rip to start again and get my guaranteed 60 to 70 with the possibility of like that 10% chance of hitting like a 90 plus or something it becomes a bit of a balancing act. You're like, I can make up a little bit and I would rather play to start who I have no questions about. It's going to have a good solid game than play this other guy. That's maybe it's like a 50% he kills you 50% he gets a hundred. Maybe you don't want that. Maybe in this situation where it's like a 10% chance you die, 80% chance of a solid score and 10% chance of a smash. You'd rather take that. Uh, so I think surface actually has a really good question. It's kind of a little bit off topic, I guess, but not really because we've sort of gone into that, but he asked, have you found any method for determining when you have too much depth and need to upgrade? I have too many cards, but since cap modes, I'm using a wider variety of mid-range cards, at, at least some of them. So to me, this is sort of how I decide if I have too many cards and should move on some of them. Uh, first question or first part of it is like the lower level, like 30, 40 type cards. You, you can never have too much of them. Uh, especially with cap modes coming in. Like if you have a guy, like I've been able to use Graven Burks the last two game weeks because his L15 is is like 30. Same thing with like the Kettlar. I've used Charles the Kettlar. His L15 was 25 and he's put up 60s and been horrible. Like the last, like area, I think he put up 40 fly actually this week. But game before he put up like 58. So those type of guys are like whatever. The, the way that I decide I have too many cards and I should shed some to sort of upgrade other positions if I consistently have a card that does not go into a lineup that I would consider good on a weekend, and I have too many cards. So, like, if I'm sitting there and I run D2s and I have Desart, and all of a sudden I run, I have Desart, and I don't use him for, like, a month in a lineup that I would consider worthwhile, I'd be like, all right, I don't really need this Desart card anymore. Um, and it's similar, like, there's, there's other players, like, Rare, same thing. Like, I had this year... Um, at one point I had two rare Pedro Gonzalez's and I was like, all right, let me see where this goes. But it consistently got to a point where I just wasn't using him in a priority lineup every week. And then the second one, like it was even lower priority. So I was like, I definitely don't need two of these. I'm going to get rid of it. Uh, so that's sort of how I decipher if I have too many cards and need to like remove some depth and put into some upgrades. How many cards do you have now? Um, let me see. Like, surely you're at a gallery point where you probably have too many cards. Oh, I definitely have too many cards. But but the thing is, is here's the thing. Like, a lot of a lot of wins are during the midweek, right? I have a thousand cards. So, the one thing I will say is, I don't think volume of cards is the right metric anymore, because. Nep is certainly an example of this. There are a ton of cards that you need to own that you will never play. And so like just pure number of cards doesn't, not that it, well, it basically doesn't matter. Yeah. Like there are so many opportunities now to turn cards that you do not use into cards that you also won't use and will help you get a collection bonus. Yeah. And so like, that's really what you should be doing with cards you don't use. I agree with that. I, I'm more talking about like guys that are like like usable cards. Like I try to do it with my rewards every week. So like I want a Raul Rui Diaz this week. I'm never gonna use that because I have one. I have one. <laughs> I bet you don't use that one either. No, I do. I, I use that one 50% of the time. But also like midweeks are really important. Like I don't know, people sort of people act like they're they're important, but then don't act like they're important. It's kind of weird with midweeks, but like you Having cards and having stacks, like if I have a stack, that's like one of the biggest benefits of having a stack is when they play, they play. 
So if they play in midweek and there's not very many much competition going on, they're going to have a game and they're going to play and they can win you rewards. Um, so midweeks definitely matter to some extent. So you never know when you're going to have a card that pops up on a midweek that is like a valuable card to you to have because all of a sudden, boom, you wouldn't have had this line if you didn't have it for the midweek. I was going to say that the card itself is not help, not valuable during a midweek like it's the pat when it becomes part of five right. then it has value no it can still matter you can have a random a random midweek game where like you have a card in it and it's like that card is the difference between like you having a lineup and not having a lineup, or you having a good lineup and not having a good line yeah but that's what i mean but like having a midweek card and not having a lineup like if you have a midweek card correct. it has no value to you unless you can put it in a lineup correct which the more cards you have the more likely you are to be able to do that that's right. More cards. Always. But I mean, you think about it, like, here's the thing, right? All right. So I have, if you include limiteds, I have 1300 cards, right? I use on a full European, the full overlap game week schedule. I have 45 lineups before Academy. So I'm at 50 lineups. That is 250 cards go into a lineup each weekend. And Let's say let's say ten percent of your ten to twenty percent of your gallery is just like dead. They're DMPs that just don't play much. Ten to twenty percent of your gallery is hurt. Another ten to twenty percent is like guys that maybe start but aren't consistent. You don't know if they start. All of a sudden, you have removed a giant chunk of your gallery, and you're down to let's say I'm down to like five hundred cards. So like on a weekend, I use two hundred fifty. So like I don't have a, an amount of cards that it's like oh my god I'm not using all these cards frequently like, I use them a lot and that I think that goes for like anyone with realistically any size gallery there like how many cards do you have Larry? Um, I don't know too many. My I have a I have baseball and uh... yeah. So all right. So in in football for sober you have two hundred cards, right? There's no way that you think two hundred cards is is too many, even though you are only entering like ten to fifteen laps a weekend. So you're using like. 50 to 75 of those cards. And I guarantee you, you're using all the guys that play consistently frequently enough. Yeah, I have, uh, well, I yeah. I don't know. Pablo Valentini just said that, yes, Laird, Paolo Diaz will start this week. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, he's locked in, man. He's locked in my lineup. I, I bet. I'll see you guys on the podium. There you go. What could go wrong with River Plate? With an eighty-three percent chance to win, who knows? Is that is that the all-star rare pro podium? Uh, it's funny you say that. So I'm not going to go into there, okay. it completely, but I may do something incredibly stupid to make sure that I don't waste my Nishikawa super rare this week as well. Like, have I have a super rare goalie in a midweek that I'm going to use? That will sabotage my River Plate stack. Assuming he starts, right? I mean, him being a DNP would just be the icing on the cake. After sure. after that error in the last game, they're back on Boogie. He's, he's good. They do yeah. like to give Zion games here and there. Yeah. Like the Zion Suzuki truthers <laughs> on So Rare are my favorite people. <laughs> good news. Good news. Half an F- on I... a rare card of a guy who is not remotely close to playing. Good news. I have a super of Zion Suzuki, so maybe I know I'll pop him in life and I'll get used to it. Actually, that is not fair on Suzuki because they're probably going to give him Champs League again like they did last year. They gave him Champs League games. I, I actually am going to win All-Star Rare Pro this week if who I have picked starts, which is the only like anomaly because I've got three Americans. Um, I've got Matt Turner on a humongous percentage bonus because I've got the Arsenal stack. Matt Miazga and Brandon Vasquez super rare. And if they yeah. would do all start, and especially Vasquez coming on and scoring, and the fact that they didn't win means Turner should start as well. Like All three should start. I, I would like to hope so. And I, I only have one super rare in the team. And then the other player is Tiquinho and the guy from uh, the CSL who's got a really, really great matchup. So Why don't either... you just go buy more Americans, Nep? Yeah, but, but, and, and that's like... The, the, do you know why? Do you know why I don't know? Because when does it end? And I like I never. have a really addictive personality, why? right? No, but that's this why, is a problem. That's I, why I, it's fun. It never no, ends. This is the thing. Like when I commit to something, I overcommit massively, and so hence, you know, spending probably like the best part of three to four ETH on a final rare stack. When I was told 
just a week or two ago by both of yourselves. I don't need to buy another rare card as long as I live. And here I am buying, you know, 25 more. So, <laughs> like, like when I commit to something, it's like I, I overcommit. And so if I'm like, all right, I'm going to buy these Americans to have a full five. That's great. But then I've got some pieces that in a month's time are going to make no sense. So then I'm going to have to buy players to kind of like make those pieces make sense. And then I've got like too many lineups for rare pro and rare. So I'm going to have to buy some more super rares to make sure those pieces make sense. And it, where does it end? And then like the whole point of so rare is like, for me anyway, as I said to you before, like there, there, there's some different nuances of what I want out of it ultimately. But ultimately, ultimately, I want to become like set for life of a so rare. And I know like everybody might want to do that and some will succeed. It will be a very, very few but I want to try and be one of those people. And if I continuously put money in, at what point do I say, okay, I've reached a, a ceiling of where I can now just get a return. If I'm just constantly buying in because next, next month there's another international tournament. And then in six months, there's a champions league game. And then in another year, there's like euros and another world cup. And it's like, at what point are you like, all right, this is okay. Let me start recouping. And that's where I don't know where my own limits are. So I'm, I like, I just decided to just not go all in. I would just, I'll let, I'll I'll let you put know myself in financial trouble. I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but I mean, <laughs> for, for buying cards and like looking at like cards in terms of buying, I almost never buy for a specific game week. I actually bought last week for a game week and, and it actually sort of kind of worked out, I guess, because I won a card. But uh, I look at it as like, can I hit like a podium? if I buy this card, this game. And if the answer is yes, I will buy the card because that means the card's probably worth having. Assuming it's not like, I'm not going to just go buy Messi and then like hope to podium. But like, so like last game weeks, I needed my, I had no rare forward that I was confident was going to start a game in U23. And my U23 rare pro lineup was pretty good, I felt. So I looked and I was like, um who what was out there and there was not much out there so i was like all right and then i looked at halong wang from uh from minnesota He's worth it for the name alone yeah and i was like this guy's pretty solid for a summer u23 forward and he's definitely gonna start so i bought him and he cost me 0.118 and i am like 15th in u23 rare pro 14 so i'm getting like a tier two he's probably a tier two so like effectively i won him by having him yeah but 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 now like if you sell him again yeah any depreciation on him is fine it's covered by the rule correct spot, right perfect if you don't sell him now you just now, now you like you've invested and you've got no return although like you've got unrealized return and I suppose, like, you know, I see what Mike and Surface Air Missile are saying in the chat. And it's like, as I say, like, I, I, I know from my own self, I have an incredibly addictive personality. And it's, it's real easy. It's real easy to, like, par everything offers. Yeah, but when I start withdrawing, it'll be worth it. I, I can invest another 10 ETH, 50 ETH, 100 ETH, whatever. That's fine. But, where, like where literally where does it end right at what point am i like i have to start like if this is going to be let's say for the you know everyone's dream like let's say it becomes a retirement fund right i think and again going back to my fifa kind of like ideas is that i think it's a lot easier to snowball something without continually investing over a prolifically long period of time than it is to just keep buying and buying and buying and setting into bad habits. And then, like, as I do now, I constantly chase losses. I'm using players that have no place in lineups because I bought them a year and a half ago for quite a lot of money, and I know they're going to start. And I'm like, if he if, if he could just eventually get me something back, I'd feel a lot better. And I saw a guy on Twitter today. I wish I bookmarked it to, to read his thread, but it's fascinating. But he, uh, he sold up everything. And deleted his account, created a brand new account to go again because he was he was constantly like plagued by his bad choices on that account. And he feels like a fresh start would like give him perspective on how his current strategies are going. And that's something that I think is genuinely valuable. And if you continually buy into game weeks or into tournaments or into events or into holes in lineups or midweeks, 
you're never going to get that perspective of anything working. I, I, I think it's valid. I mean, it's definitely like I, from my first month on the platform to like where I was at like the six month mark to where I was at the, the year plus mark was, is so different. I actually, I literally can tell you what the differences were, but also the game, right? Game evolves and things yeah. change. And we like, we didn't have cat mode uh, a year ago. We didn't have uh, some of these other competitions. You can play a rare goalie in the super contest before, but so like the first week I was on the platform, actually Laird, Laird gave me a good piece of advice and we'll see if he remembers what this was. But so like my first couple of weeks on the platform, I basically was led by Laird. Well, I mean, do you guys look where you are now, Sean? Look you guys you led by Laird? He got royalties on his gallery then, Laird. Uh, no, he, yeah, he, got, he, got a, that. he got a collection Demer bonus Bay. of sorts. He got a Kareem Demer Bay card for it. Um, I did. But and lifelong friendship. That's so he got the most valuable thing you could get. Do you remember what your advice was to me like the first day of being on the platform? Don't buy cards yet? No. Uh, no. Okay. His first piece of advice was peep he like buy super rares. He's like, people, he's like, everyone I talk to, the only regret they ever have when they're buying cards and stuff is that they didn't buy enough super rares and the prices get high on them. So that was his first piece of advice. But anyways, so like at first, the way I was approaching things was like I bought uh, a lot of rares and layered like buy super rares. So then I started buying some super rares. But a lot of the cards I bought the first like three to six months on the platform were guys that were like, okay. I Because back then, but back then I just wanted to win stuff. I wanted to win like a tier two. I wanted to, to, to win a tier three. I just wanted to win cards, right? But also back then like tier twos, tier threes were worth like 0.1 ETH. So like winning any card was was valuable. To, to a good amount of value in it. Uh, if you want to start back then, like you're getting like a 15 ETH card possibly in certain situations. Um, so like that was a, a, a issue I went to. Then I went to the strategy of, okay, if I buy like this, everyone has the IAC stacks or the Bayern stacks or the PSG stacks. If I buy the Gank stack, it will be a lot cheaper than buying that and I'll still win uh, quite a bit of rewards. What I then realized was like I bought that and but the issue was is like I paid like three ETH for that and won like five ETH off it. Where if I just bought an IAC stack for six ETH, I would have won like 20 ETH off it. So the ROI was just a lot better buying an IAC, not the IAC stack, but like buying these other these other cards instead. So it's just sort of like there's a lot of evolution that goes into this game because uh, things change, contest offerings change, the way the game is played has changed. Like there's sure shit no way I'm playing guys that have like a 30 L15 that I'm expecting to score 45 points in any lineup. But now, now that's, that happens. Now you go into weekend and you're like, oh, this guy has a L15 of 25, but I can expect him to score 50. That's a great card for this matchup. So uh, I think there's some validity into that is like, you have to be able to understand if your strategies are working and being successful. I think the first two years I was on the platform, the only advice I ever got from people who were, there before me was like super rares are underpriced. Like, but it was like, if it's two years and they're underpriced and then finally they came out with the cap mode and then super rares finally took off. Like I, I was, I was thinking this a, a few times, but just today again, before we started here, like the price of rares right now is low. Like super rares are very scarce. Price limiteds are like excruciatingly low, which actually is a really good entry point for new people. If so rare does get adopted by the masses, like let's let's say a million active users are here in six months' time. There's not enough limited Mbappes to go around. There's not enough limited Haaland's or Vinicius Juniors to go around. Do they have to introduce another scarcity, or are prices just going to continue going up massively? And if if they do introduce another scarcity, like a one of ten thousand sort of scarcity, does that also therefore mean that rares are a good investment because they were are equivalent? in terms of scale as super rares right now, and they are also massively underpriced. I think that was their, their intention. The way that they've built things is to always have a scalable model, right? Whereas like if they get a million users, they would have a one of 10,000 scarcity. If they have 10 million users, they could have a one of 100,000 scarcity. I think that's kind of how they set things up. I think they expanded to the 10,000. 
I think they expanded to the point of the one of 1000s and then they just auctioned off a bit too many and they they expanded past what the numbers were of people that were interested on the platform. Um, but I look at it as like poker or like DFS. They're, they're always going to have a cheap buy-in for the masses, right? Which is going to be like the in poker be like a three dollar game it's not going to cost three dollars here because you get to keep the cards forever and you get to use them every week so like maybe that line is going to cost you 100 200 bucks then there's going to have a next level where like the next level is going to cost you like 500 bucks then the next level is going to cost you like two thousand then the next level is going to cost you like ten thousand the next level is going to cost you like twenty five thousand so i think there's just going to be different levels always that where people will be interested in it um the, the key the key to me is always you need to have interest at the higher levels if there's not interest at the higher levels then the people at the lower levels can't sell their cards because no one's there to buy them and you just have a product that won't be successful whereas like if you have guys you always want people to be wanting to advance and progress upwards and like in poker if you're playing poker like you want to play like the main event the poker world series poker main event that's what like everyone like wants to play in to be uh established right whereas but like you can't do that some people like they have to start at like the 200 dollars tournaments and then all of a sudden they're they're moving their way up but if you if you have like the ten thousand dollar main event and then you win like five hundred dollars it's like all right well i don't give a shit about that <laughs> yeah 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 i think <clears throat> there's so much of this platform that people like there's inherently a value in the in every card of an expectation that there will be a million users at some point. Yeah. Like we don't buy cards thinking there will be fewer users or the same number of users in the future. And and there were so many people who were complaining about limited the limited scarcity cards and that there were too many of them and that that's why prices dropped because there're just not enough users. The problem is is that there are too many users without limits. Meaning if we had this number of users but there was no limited cards, the prices of rares would be absurd if you just think of supply and demand. So you needed to have the limited cards to bring them in. I, I have to believe that the, the goal is to have to have another scarcity because they have so many users. Because a million users with a scarcity of one of a thousand is not enough. And it, the 10,000, like uh, somebody mentioned this a while ago, might've been Nellis. But there was a complaint that like, there's so many limited cards. And at some point they're gonna be like 10,000 Mbappe limiteds. But if you have a million users, 10,000 is a small number. Yeah. Like it's too small, realistically, for, for everybody to be able to, not that everybody should be able to get one, but like for enough people who could financially get an Mbappe, they're just not enough. And if you just play that, to rares and super rares, like obviously those will be more valuable, but they, like the, this game currently cannot exist like it does, like it is with a million users. That's why you need another scarcity. But we, you could make the argument we don't have enough users now for the number of limited cards we have, which is fair. Yeah. But we also don't. We have too many users for just rares, rare super rare units. So that, does that mean limited is also massively undervalued? Because you can't really go lower than like. 50 cents <laughs> if if you get to a million yeah if you think that th that there are going to be a million users then yeah they are undervalued scott but there's no guarantee up, we're getting to a million no scott what brings up a point and he said that free to play is the scaling option and they don't need to do more scarcities i don't think that's true because i think that if you ever make the free to play version too good people are just going to play the free to play version so the the idea is you can't have the free to play version be that good enough uh to there's, do it and then there's no way for the free to play version to mimic the pay to play version. Yeah. Like it's impossible. Agreed. And so it's always going to be a different game. Correct. And then XMK Productions asked, do we think limited pro is needed to bridge the gap from limited to rares? I mean, there should, I don't think if there's a gap, like people aren't going to really care if there's a limited pro added per se. Um, I, mean, I don't think pros, yes, would, would rares go up. I don't really think that rares would really go up that much in that situation, but I do also think that there should be a limited pro. It makes sense due to how the platform is constructed. I know people have said that there shouldn't be a all-star rare pro. It should just be the single scarcity. I hate that. Uh, Laird knows I hate yeah. that. 
but that's not there should, be, there should be pro divisions in each scarcity level in my opinion it, i think i assume you're talking about what maxime has said about like the pro level and i don't it's not I, that he doesn't want it it's like the thought of maybe so rare actually doesn't feel no no i'm talking about like we've heard that that's a rumor from so rare. we heard rumors that like year like a year or two ago they were going to move everything to to uh to a single scarcity division but like i i just i i honestly hate it i think from a progression standpoint it doesn't make sense i think there should be it, it's it is the most logical progression step where you don't need to just have boom five super rares you can have two or one or zero like the Penthes is talking about i do think you should make it a mandatory that you have to use super rares like i think the rare pro division shouldn't be you should have to use super rares. that's how you like incentivize people to progress that's how we get nepped for some but, but, use that, but at that point it would make way more sense right it would right. make more sense like like yeah. that point like in that situation makes way more sense but like i that's what like progression wise like you should have a a limited pro you should have a super rare pro you should have a unique division right like unique division should be five you should have to have five and the the unique pro division is like or the super rare pro division is like two so it's it's a progression upwards that helps you do it, and I I've always thought that's the the right way to go. The difficulty they have though, isn't it, is prizes. Well, Only... they can always have prizes. That's always going to be the kicker. They're yeah, all, the it's always the kicker in terms of cards, but like they have started to do experiences, and and they can give e like there's just different ways to do it. Like you obviously you have a bit of a different. Um, background than, than most people like you've been successful on youtube you have more inroads to different places you can go right like you maybe can have an event at arsenal someone else can't so like if you get uh, the, the ability for someone to like get an experience to go to a Bayern game and get on the pitch for a 11 aside game or something that's worth a lot I know our friend surface is in here and he doesn't think that type of stuff is valuable but it, Giving jerseys, valuable. Giving tickets, valuable. Giving I, I, I disagree massively in the current outlook, right? First place in the MLS All-Star game. Week, or actually, how where does tickets pay down to? Third, right? Or fifth or something. Uh, tickets pays it's down right. to fourth place, right? Yeah. Fourth place is just 355 points. And the reason why I think people didn't edit, enter into it, aside from the fact it's actually quite hard to find on the site, is because all you get is the tickets. Correct. So... I, I'm going to have to spend like thousands of dollars to get out there and accommodate myself for a, a pair of tickets that I'm not even allowed to sell in the first place. And until they start adding an, an experience package rather than tickets, I don't think experiences are actually valid as a prize at the moment. I agree with that. When I'm saying experiences, I mean, they actually, their experience package has to become better. Like if I win a, this is how it should be, right? This is how it should be. Your competition is top four get a two tickets to the MLS All Star Game. They get two nights accommodation and they get a thousand dollars for travel. That is how you do those experiences, and that it, it's totally realistic long term possibility, right? Because eventually, as this company continues to grow, which it should, you can get a sponsorship deal with Marriott. Oh, boom, there's a Marriott in literally every city you'd go to in America. Yeah. Hey, Marriott, we need four hotel rooms for two nights for this MLS thing. Cool. That's part of our sponsorship deal. So there's there's deals that can be that way. But yeah, that's the biggest issue right now with their experience situation is, yeah, you can win a cool experience, like Liverpool situation. Like if, if I got invited to Liverpool situation, could have came over, it would have probably cost me $3,000 to do that. Well, no, most people don't have just three thousand dollars just spur of the moment, boom, boom, drop it. Like for you to come to the MLS All Star Game, it probably cost you a couple grand, and that's just not a realistic long term thing. And that takes away some of the experience situation. Um, they need to include travel and accommodations within those packages. Yeah, that, that's two thousand dollars I could have spent on five desserts, you know. Exactly. Like. <laughs> My favorite is that Nep is totally in on being able to like just anything is now relative to certain cards. Nep, 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 so so really like consumes me, man. Like 
like like it's weird like with fifa sometimes i buy fifa points and ea just increased the value of those by 10 percent. so it's like even after the discount it's 80 pounds for twelve thousand fifa points which i can use to benefit work in some ways but overall is just like a gross misuse of money even without so rare existing it's just it's just stupid but today i i paid like 70 pounds for a final rare and i was i was like i was contemplating it and i was overthinking i was like damn like that's that's a lot of like i've got so many rares already in my gallery so and i was like i i bought like three lots of fever points two days ago just because and yeah i'm worried about this here and yeah i, I uh I think I think too much now about everything. I'm like, oh, I could actually not spend that and instead buy another really good player on so rare. And it, as bad as it is, I also think it's good because it means the product's good, right? Like there was that with, and it, like fiat is much more prevalent. Now. I mean, like you look at and you always talk about card prices like in fiat. But I remember months ago, somebody. Maybe it was even longer than that. But somebody was talking about buying a PlayStation and they were like, I forget what, how much, whatever, hundred, a couple hundred bucks. And like, man, that's a lot. And they're like, it's actually only like 0.2 ETH. So like, yeah, I'll just do it. Yeah, that's okay. And like when, when we looked at it in ETH, you were just like, oh yeah, just buy it. It's no problem. But like when, when you get in the fiat and so, but now it's like, what cards can I get? Instead of buying this, I can get cards and yeah, there's that. We've completely lost the topic, uh, and I think Nep, you have Another a long one, man. I'm sorry. I just I can yeah. I like to talk. <clears throat> well, this is only like seven out seven hours and twenty minutes shorter than your last one. So <laughs> uh, thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, like, subscribe, share the video. Make sure you just watch the whole thing, really. And then, um, like I said, Nep is on like every day. So uh, go over to Twitch.tv. It's just slash Nepenthes, right? Simple as that. Yeah. So check all that out. Again, follow him on Twitter. Um, so yeah, Nep, thanks for coming on. I think, I have no idea if we answered the question. I don't think it's actually a question that can be answered, but at least gave everybody uh, something to think about when they're considering going from rare to rare pro. So gentlemen, thank you for that. And everyone, good luck this week.